Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is Brian John Mitchell. He is the owner of Silver Media and they do something a little different in terms of comic publication. Instead of the standard comic books, they work on mini comics about the size of a book of matches. Brian, welcome to Comic Culture. Thank you, sir. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. So this is a unique size for a comic, and some of the stories are pretty compelling. Uh, some of them are very personal. And I'm just wondering, what gave you the idea to make comics this size? Well, what originally happened was I come from a zining background um, instead of like a fine arts type background. So I had, in the 90s, I was making all, all these all these punk rock zines that they were like interviewing different musicians and things. And then as the internet exploded, all of a sudden the purpose of a zine was a little different because you uh, you know you could get all the information you want on the internet. And so I switched to being mainly an internet-based zine, uh, web zine or whatever. And uh, the San Jose Museum of Art was doing this uh, this zine exhibit. And because my zine had a little bit of renown, I was asked to to send them a new zine to be part of the exhibit. And so I hadn't printed a zine in like two years. And I was like, well, what would I need to do for it to be worth it to me to make a physical object? And I was like, well, it would have to be something where the physicality of it is really important since the Internet is better at disseminating information to the masses than printing 100 copies of a book. So I was like, well, for it to be important the size, it would have to either be something you know massive, like bigger than a newspaper, which is unaffordable for me to print, or something really small. And uh, so I came up with this format that it's, a, a uh, about half the size of a business card. You just just from folding up a sheet of paper and figuring out what would work. And so then I, uh, I was like, okay, well, I'd I'd started doing some comic stuff in one of my zines. So I was like, I'm gonna do a comic, and it's only gonna use one sheet of paper. Which one sheet of paper in this format is uh, 48 pages. You know, front and back pages, total of 48 panels. And so that was the first issue of Lost Kisses, and every uh, review of the of the art exhibit mentioned my zines or my comic as like, like you know, like this is this is one of the unique things that they can do. So I was like, well, I guess I'm doing something right. So then I just uh, kept doing it. Early on, it was like I would do like one a year, um, and now sometimes I'm doing like three or four a month. So yeah. Uh, that's... You know, just based on how much time I have and all this stuff. Well, it's interesting. We have a couple of uh, stills that you sent to just give us, to give our audience a size, uh, a sense of the scale of these comics. So if we could take a look at one of the uh, images that we had. Um, the first one is um, a book, and we see, compared to an action figure, this is uh, sort of like a giant um, uh, children's book for an action figure. But if I were looking at a toy and looking at this book, they're pretty much the same size. And I think we have another one that really sums it up. It's about the size of a matchbook, which kids don't smoke. Um, but uh, it, it's an interesting format. And I was reading through some of these stories. Um, I've got in my hand Seabase 17 here, where we have the tale of a, an undersea explorer who is, uh, I guess, marooned after meeting a giant squid underwater. Um, now, you were saying that you can do uh, 48 panels, or 48 pages, I guess, out of one single sheet of paper. What size is the art? Um, it, it depends. Some some people draw it as big as uh, like five by seven or so per panel. Um, originally, of course, I drew at actual size because, you know, like that's how everybody starts, you know, because you don't know any better. At, but um, with my comics now, I draw it's it's slightly larger. It's like an, like the. Printed size is 1.33 inches by 1.625 inches for a panel, and I'm drawing it at like two and a half by three is the size that I typically draw at. Um, but each each I, I collaborate with a lot of different artists for the different series, so each of them kind of decides for themselves. And sometimes you'll you can tell that oh they were drawing it really large because the uh, 
the words end up being really tiny because you know they when you draw large um, words are really the hardest thing when you're drawing to a different scale to uh, have the words be large enough. Well, it's it's something that um, when I look at the artwork, you say some people work larger. Um, I would imagine that if somebody had a very detailed style working on a much larger uh, page, um, even if it were as large as five by seven, that's that's a lot more detail that we're going to lose being reduced yeah. down to this uh, one and a half or so uh, square size. Um, yeah. So have you had any books where the artist has really done a great job, but just when it came out on the, the printed page, it just didn't work as well as you would hoped? Yeah, yeah. It's happened a few times, but luckily, like, because I had I had started doing them on my own, um, everyone that I collaborated with, basically, it's been like there's somebody that I meet at a convention or somebody that's stumbled across my comics somehow. So they're already kind of familiar with the format going in. So they're not like, you know, shocked. Oh, my gosh, this is so small. But at the same time, um, there are some that I like, have that we've discussed, like doing it at a at a bigger size, maybe doing it like re doing a reprinting eventually where it'd be like four inches by four inches or the five by seven that they originally drew it at. Um, but it's just, you know, on the one hand, it's like it'd be great to have the art like that. But then it's like also all of a sudden you're that ash can comic size and you lose a little bit of the special nature of these books, you know, because you can't just put, put it in your vest pocket or whatever. It's interesting because I, I spoke with um, uh, David Peterson of Mouse Guard, and he was talking mm -hmm. about the unique size that he uh, publishes his book at. It's a square instead of a, I guess, uh, a portrait style page. And he said that was a result of uh, seeing people put out ash cans and thinking he didn't want just another book that was going to be that size. So he found a new way to fold the paper. Instead of using uh, a regular uh, sheet, he was using legal size, and that gave him two squares. Uh -huh. um, so interesting. It's, it's interesting, yeah. It's just one of those things that when we think about ways to stand out uh, among the, the, I guess, the chatter, whether it's on the internet or whether it's on TV or in the world of uh, the printed page, coming up with a new distribution method or a new uh, way to present that information is, uh, it's just a fun way to, to sort of tweak it and stand out and, and keep ourselves uh, in the public eye a little bit more than yeah. if a we were average. I've, a trick I've seen a couple people do that's kind of interesting when you get the legal size paper, which is actually kind of hard to find now. There's something's happened where legal paper is a little bit hard to find for printing. But you can take your cover will be printed at legal size. And then you have this, you know, this uh, three inch fold over that goes over across the across the front or in. So you kind of get like a, a a weird fold going like they open this and then they open that and then they can use this little fold as a bookmark or or what have you um that's pretty I, it's, I, i'd have to show you an example for it to make sense but well i think i, I understand it, it's something where there's just a little bit of the extra paper and you're able to use that uh sort of like a like a slip cover on a, a novel yeah, you, exactly. or dust jacket you would use that to sometimes keep your page uh, not that I recommend yeah. you do that with that pristine copy of uh, yeah. To Kill a Mockingbird, but... Um, yeah. Well, you can use it to, like, I've seen it used where they have that, and that'll be like, you know, if it's a sci-fi thing with a lot of jargon, you can have that be your jargon page, that little fold, and so, you know, it makes it interesting, but... Yeah, and again, it's, yeah. it's, it's that way of standing out from the crowd, having some jargon page, whether it's that that unique uh, printed size. It gives the reader something to, uh, to feel connected to a little bit more than you know, the, the regular style book or something like yeah. that. Um, now, a lot of the stories that are uh, in these mini comics are different than you would read, whether it were a superhero or an adventure comic, or even if it were something like Love and Rockets, where it's you know, a relationship comic. They're, they're sort of boiled down to some are um, uh, poems, some are, um, I guess, the equivalent of a, a comic version of Moby Dick, not the actual story, but but those sort of um, you know themes in literature. And I'm just wondering, when you are speaking with the the writers and artists who work on these books, or, or when you put your own work together, what approach? I mean, are you looking for that unique approach? Or are you just thinking to yourself, this is a story that works well in this this size, this format, or is it just something like, hey, it's an open open arena and let's have some fun? Well, it's interesting because 
I started out doing the auto bio book, the typical, you know, American Splendor style stories where it's just like a slice of life. And when it was getting, when I was getting the reviews early on, it was always, uh, always people would be saying like, this work, this is really interesting and it works for this type of story, but I can't imagine it working for any other type of story. And so, you know, I, I felt like that was kind of a challenge to, is that true? And so that got me to start doing some horror books and some sci-fi books. And I was, and I realized it's like, it's, it's not the scope or the scale of the story. That's the challenge of this format. It's the, uh, the length of the sentences. Um, cause you can basically, you only have like a hundred characters worth of material per page. So it's almost, it's kind of like if you, if you are used to using Facebook and then you move to Twitter and all of a sudden it's, or even more so it's like if you're used to doing a blog and then you move to Twitter, it's like, you need to get that same thing squished down into this short amount of space. And so that's the, that's the challenge. And I think, I think it is possible that anything goes, but, um, it's the same way as anything goes in a comic. And it's like you can tell any story you want in a comic, but some stories translate better to the sequential art medium than others, you know. And, you know, I'm sure that I'm sure there are some novels that if you tried to translate them into a comic, it, you'd lose something for the transition. Uh, it's funny. You mentioned American Splendor, which is one of those um, those great underground comics. And. I mean, these mini comics do come across uh, as sort of that underground, and you were talking about uh, working on zines back in the 90s. Uh, one of my favorites was a, a, a zine called Neck, the magazine for people with a neck. Um, it was only one issue, but it did feature the Lost Partridge Family episode, which made my day. Um, now, getting back to the idea of, of personal stories in comics, um, and American Splendor in particular, he did that uh, so well. But one of the stories that, that you sent me, uh, I think this morning, was um, a story called H.G., which I think is somewhat autobiographical, and, and you said that you, uh, congratulations, you just had a, a baby last month, so uh, I think that this is something that you pulled from real life. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's, this one is, it was, it was funny because I didn't know if my wife was going to want me to tell this story because it was like, it was a really rough period in our life because she had hyperemesis gravidarum, which is... Uh, like its claim to fame recently was uh, the Princess of Wales, what it, Princess Kate or whatever her name is, that she was diagnosed with it. And in different people are diagnosed with it in different ways. Like some, some people it is basically like they complained about morning sickness to the right doctor and he gave them meds about it. But other people, like we went to the, we went into the hospital multiple times with with her suffering from dehydration and her kidneys su shutting down because the vomiting had gotten to the that extreme where water wasn't staying down, you know, everything was not good. And, you know, it's like, and we run our own businesses, so she had to shut down her, her business because, you know, you can't be at that level of not functioning and work at the same time. So it's, you know, it was a pretty, pretty severe uh life challenge mm -hmm. so but um so i wrote the initial script and i was like i wrote this thing if you don't want me to make it i won't make it you know and she, she thought it she thought it was good and that i should should make it um she actually had me change the ending to what the ending is now originally was a little bit darker because when like we were still in it um when when i wrote it it was like I wrote it like maybe a month before the baby was born and it was like we were still like at this spot where it's like are are we gonna survive or is are we not gonna make it through uh, because of just the health issues get so so bad with it well we have some uh samples of that story and uh the first one i wanted to uh show our audience was was one where I think you use a little bit of humor uh, in the book, in the story. You say, exorcist-style vomiting is not normal. Yeah. And you're using a very simple art style, and I understand you had another artist actually do the art for you. Yeah, um, Jason Young drew this one for me. I've collaborated with him many times. He, um, 
He's from uh, Dayton, Ohio, and his his main comic is called Veggie Dog Saturn, and it's a an autobio style comic. Um, and he uh, the thing to me that is makes him special is he really has this ability to uh, convey emotion, even when he, his style is really simple in a lot of ways. You know, it's not you know photorealistic or anything, but he just has this ability to convey emotion um, from panel to panel. So that's why I thought he was the right artist for it. And I think it shows up in the, the next two panels that we're going to show. Um, it speaks to that emotion that he's able to convey with this very simple uh, illustration style. It's, I like to pretend the whole experience is making us closer. And it's just a very nice representation. We see the couples holding hand. And then the humor comes back where we see um, preparing us for some future uh, catastrophe. And it looks like there's uh, the Armageddon going on while the two of them are holding hands. Um, and it, it sums up the whole feeling of uncertainty. And, and I get a real sense of, of what you must have been going through. And yet at the same time, I, I'm able to enjoy it as a, a reader. And I feel like you know there's the pathos and there's the connection to the characters. Um, and it's you know one page illustrations in a book that's 48 pages or 39 pages uh, of simple uh, stick style figures. Yeah, yeah. One of the things I I realized working in this uh, in this, I mean, it it's I mean, it, it could have been a different format, but working in comics in general is if you're if you're going to be like have this dark and serious subject matter, and you don't put in the comedy in the drawing part, it just becomes really undigestible and um, I had I've had a couple comics where I felt like you know um, like I did a collaboration with Dave Sim of Cerebus fame and uh, he does his photorealistic drawings and it's a dark story and it's like you walk away feeling like oh not feeling good because it's just you know it's a depressing story and uh, versus if like this story is just as depressing but because it's done in a more cartoony Bigfoot style or whatever, you walk away feeling like, oh, this is this is fun. Um, so, you know, but I did try to I have tried to intentionally interject humor into this story because there's really just there's no way you can survive as a human being going through through this every day um, and not embrace some kind of humor or you, you just have to walk away. Right. Well, I'm, I'm thinking that you probably didn't want to buy stock in the, the lemon drops. Um, no, no. That, uh, yeah. It's, it's, just a, it's just such a such a nightmare experience. And I mean, it's, it's weird because even like a month later, it's like kind of like you're like, man, I can't believe it really was as bad as it was. So, I mean, it's like you, you know, it's like it's not something that you'll ever forget, but it is just like definitely part of the past. So we're glad to move on. The, everything's fine. The baby's the baby's perfectly healthy. We didn't have any complications. Left the hospital after two days. So everything's everything's awesome. Well, I mean, that's first off, that's that's great news. But it does speak to you know the tone. I think because there were the complications, and yet it, it ends on that sort of positive note. Uh, it, it really, it's, you're able to enjoy it as a reader thinking that, yeah, this is, a, this is just a dark period, but there's, you know, there's always that, that spark, that you know, glow in the corner. You know that there's the light at the end of the tunnel um, yeah. that's coming towards you. Um, now, you said you worked with, with Dave Sims. How did that come a, about? And was that um, a mini-comic as well? Yeah, yeah, it was the same format. Um, it's uh, Ultimate Lost Kisses number 11, and then I worked with him on a, a, another comic called Point. And, uh, and the way, the way it came about was Dave Sims always been like, uh, really active with his fans uh, as far as letter writing and stuff. And so I just wrote him a letter in like, I guess 2008 or so. And, uh, that I had done a comic that had some Cerebus references in it. And I sent him that and I wrote him a letter and he wrote me back and we've been having a correspondence back and forth for several years now um but i had this this you know i had what was my standard style for lost kisses these stick figure comics 
and I wrote this story that I thought was like kind of too serious for dealing with it with the stick figures. And I sent him and I, I sent him a copy of the script and just asked him like, do you think that, that I should do this story with stick figures or I should try and do something else? And he sent it back with the completed artwork. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so that's, that's how that came to fruition. Um, and I mean, like we, uh, I got a, uh, I got a plaque for, for it from a uh, space at the small press and alternative comics expo up in Columbus, um, as one of the, one of the best mini comics in the show. So, um, but like Dave Simmons had told me like, you know, like he personally wasn't as pleased as he could be with it because he's like, you know, it's, it's hard, it's hard to digest these kinds of stories when, uh, when you do have that photorealism going with it. So. Interesting. Um, these yeah. books, uh, I'm, I see, I have a copy of Ultimate Lost Kisses number 15 um, here, where the, the artwork is uh, different from uh, the one that we just saw for HG. Um, and again, I guess that speaks to uh, being able to work at that smaller size. And, and I guess it's easier since it is a smaller size for an artist to maybe scan it and reduce it to see how, how it may reproduce later on. Um, but it's interesting, I read a book recently called uh, He Done Her Wrong, which came out in the late 1920s. It was done by a cartoonist by the name of Milt Gross. I don't know if you're familiar with him or not. Mm -hmm. um, and it was um, a silent novel. That was the joke. And it was uh, each page, is about 300 pages long. Each page was a single illustration that told this very silent film style story of uh, a mountain man who's tricked by the, uh, his business partner. He steals the girl away from him, and then the mountain man has to go to the big city to win her back. And it's full of, you know, some gags and, and uh, I guess, humor that would probably be more appropriate in the 20s than it would be here in 2015. Uh, but it was the same sort of principle where it was one illustration per page, and you, you kind of had the same kind of pacing that, uh, that you were able to achieve with these mini-comics. Uh, something I'd recommend if you have the opportunity yeah, to look it up. I'm a, I'm, you probably know Lind Ward, God's Man. Mm -hmm. uh, a novel in woodcuts and so and that actually was influential to me to do in this style which you know it's it's kind of the same thing where each it's single panels each panel panels made with a woodcut um 100 they're like 100 page um stories um and was that from the the same time period or yeah that's that? from the 1920s or so okay um, well then that was actually what inspired uh milt gross to do his Okay. His novel, because he was doing sort of a, a tongue-in-cheek interpretation of that. Um, okay. Uh, and I know Kitchen Sink did a, a, a full uh, edition about five or so years ago, and you can pick that up on eBay uh, for those of you at home looking for the ultimate Christmas gift. Um, <laughs> we have about uh, five minutes uh, or so left in our show, and I just mm -hmm. wanted to talk to you uh, again about um, these comics and how you distribute them. Now, they're actually printed, so I'm imagining that uh, this is something since it is a single sheet of paper, is this something that you can print out on your own or is this something that you send yeah. out to the publisher? Yeah, no, I have a, I have a, a, you know, it's a consumer end, but it's a laser printer. And actually, even though they could be printed on a sheet of paper, it's advantageous to me to print them in such a way that it yields uh, 12 at a time because then I, then I don't need to do as much uh, collating and I just, uh, I, so I print out 12 copies of a book and then uh, I cut everything by hand with a paper cutter and then I fold everything by hand and staple them and then I put them in the little plastic bag and uh, it's pretty labor intensive, um, especially since I'm like charging only one or two dollars for the item, but you know, it's like if there really was this vast popularity and like I suddenly had a demand for thousands of copies of an issue or something. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'd probably have to like just price it, price it higher because I'm, I'm like assembling more than like, like a couple hundred. It really starts to, to be a headache. You know, um, you, you know, you start to, you start to feel it when you staple a few thousand items. You're like, okay, <laughs> this is, this is not as, as fun as I wanted it to be. This is a little tedious, but yeah, I just, um, I, they're all, it's all, it's all by hand. Um, I do think about getting a better paper cutter sometimes, but, um, <laughs> now, do they're you, like, 
Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, do you have an example of a, a page uh, as you print it out? Um, well, I have. This is a uh, this is a, a drafting page where um, I'm writing on it the uh, numbers so I'll know the number layout. Mm -hmm. But let me hold on one second. I can bring you a bring you a sheet. Sure. Um, so we'll just uh, wait one moment. We're going to take a look at a, uh, a sheet of a mini comic. Uh, if you're interested in finding out more about mini comics, you can go to uh, Silber Media, S I L B E R Media dot com, uh, and you can find an entire array of different mini comics. Again, they are about a dollar a piece, and you can probably uh, you know find a few copies. Uh, Brian, you're back. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if you can see it too good, but. Okay, so this is the cover of Walrus number four, and you see it's like the same thing printed multiple times here. Mm -hmm. And then this is, of course, the other side. So I have to run the cut. I'll, I'll cut it here, and I'll cut it here. And then each of those segments that's left, I'll cut boom, 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 and then I fold it. So that's how this this ends up making a... 12 copies of this issue, it's about, you know, a dozen sheets of paper right in here, which is about the limit of how, how much my paper cutter can cut. <laughs> so, and it's also the limit of, you know, when you fold more than like, more than 14 sheets of paper, all of a sudden it uh, starts to buckle a little bit. So, because almost works, everything works out. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it is also, it's, it's a return to, uh, I guess, the more artisan crafts because you're doing this all by hand. You're not using uh, the internet to distribute. I guess you're using it to, as a, as a, as a yeah, sales outlet. Um, yeah. Being told we have to wrap up. Uh, we've been talking to okay. Brian John Mitchell. Brian, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you at home for watching Comic Culture. We'll see you again next time. <laughs>